Greetings and Kenichiwa, and welcome back to the Onyx Tavern Vlog series on Russia Sentai Tokyujer. I'm your host, Rick the Barkeep, and today let's talk about station number 41, the Christmas Battle. So before we start, I just want to give you guys kind of a real brief summary on what this episode is about. They fight and fight and fight and fight and fight, 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 fight. That's that's pretty much it. <laughs> Uh, yes, this episode is kind of low on a lot of story. Uh, there is some in there, just not too much. And a good two-thirds of it is really just fighting and battling and killing people off and a lot of crazy stuff. And it actually reminded me of the Go On Your Christmas episode where they basically had a similar thing. There's very little story, but there was a lot of fighting going on. I will argue that this one has a lot more story than the Go Andra episode, but there I look at them as, as being kind of equal, or even kind of on the same level as, say, Forever Red, which, again, didn't have much story to it, uh, but there was a lot of action going on, and, and that was quite interesting. But this episode, I, I think, is very effective. I'm not by no means saying it's the best episode or one of the better episodes. It's just it's not offensive. It does a lot of house cleaning and gives us definitely eye candy for the holiday season. I mean, this, of course, did air you know during December of 2014. So let, let's actually get into the story and, and go over what happens and the positives uh, that I have with it. Because believe it or not, I do have a number of positives about this episode a after watching it. So we pick up where we left off. The castle terminal has risen from the ground or the alternate dimension or wherever the heck it came from in the first place. And it is discovered that below the castle, at least that's what I'm understanding, below the castle is the Tokyujer hometown. And I'm actually a little lost on this point, and maybe the series will clarify as we go along, is that if it's underground, then basically the physical space in which it manifests is the actual location of their town. Because if that's the case, then we can just take the drill rush into the junction point and then find the town. I mean, is that what's going on? I'm, I'm not sure. The episode really doesn't spend a lot of time on that. But, but basically, the castle has risen. There's a whole bunch of craziness going on with the darkness, and I'll get into that. And... The Tokyuja are still, you know, fighting Schwartz. They're fighting Zet. They're fighting Akira. Everybody's fighting everyone. It basically becomes a battle royale uh, at, at some point, uh, although not with the middle school murdering. Anyway, um, the most important thing that kind of the most important things that happen in this fight is that uh, Wright basically defends Akira. Um, Schwartz ends up uh, battling uh, against. Uh, Zet and Zet morphs into Toku, uh, Rokugo, which actually is kind of interesting to see, uh, you know, our Red Ranger and our Orange Ranger to go ahead and fight against each other. I kind of like that, especially when it's like, here's the thing, far too often we have it where Rangers will get, go against each other because there's a miscommunication, they don't like each other for some sort of petty reason, there's mind control or whatever, but this was the actual battle where the villain had the Ranger morpher. He's not an evil ranger in the sense of, say, the Psycho Rangers or the evil Green Ranger. He's just the bad guy that happens to have the Morpher that he stole. And so it's kind of an interesting, you know, battle between the two. And I liked it because it is a shakeup of that normal dynamic that we get. And, of course, uh, Ray is able to defeat Zet and get the Morpher back. Um, as far as Zet, he's still battling uh, Shorts and everything. Now, they're able to free Glitter from Zet. Now, the previous episode, and I think the one before, kind of made this point that if Zet and Glitter were separated, something terrible would happen, and I'm still not quite sure what that means exactly. Because Glitter is able to be removed from Zet in this episode by help of her mother, and really the only thing that seems to happen is that Zet gets uh, a more powerful upgrade, he becomes more powerful. Now, when they inter what I interpreted from this, when they say you know, if we split, that some terrible like he'll go nuclear and blow up, or or something really bad would happen. All that seems to happen is that just becomes more powerful, gets another alternate form, and I I don't know how many he's had this particular season. Um, and then there is some sort of dialogue like there's no trace of sparkle left in him. And, and here's the thing: this is what kind of bugs me about. Zet and the villains so far, is that the darkness is so ill-defined in what's happening to them, what's happening to Zet, Zet's motivations about the light, why he hates darkness. 
frankly, we're we're almost at the end of the series into the series, and none of that has been well defined at this point. We have imagination versus darkness, and while they're not tangible concepts, I just can't kind of wrap my head around what the what each is trying to go ahead and accomplish. Like we said, the imagination is higher at Christmas because it's Christmas. Why is imagination higher at Christmas exactly? Yes, happy and warm feelings are higher at Christmas, but imaginations? Do, do you imagine more during Christmas than you do any other time of the year? I'm not sure I understand that. And the darkness, I mean, I would assume that the darkness is akin to the nothingness that we see from the never-ending story. But again, in the never-ending story, that was the allegory for non-existence and um, uh, no life after death, and again, the ceasing to exist. But that doesn't seem to be what darkness is here. Darkness is a state of existence, but we're not told what that state of existence is. And to, to further point this out, what we have not seen in the series is the consequences of darkness exactly. Sure, we have the Shadow Towns where they're completely frozen, but I'm not necessarily seeing where that's a negative since essentially the people who are in those towns become immortal and nothing really bad happens to them except they're frozen in time. I'm, I'm not sure how negative that is compared to, you know, murdering a bunch of people, I, I guess would be the alternative, or ceasing to exist. And then we know that things can live in the darkness. The entire shadow line is, is proof of that. And their existence doesn't seem to be bad. I mean, all things considered, I mean, what about the darkness is so horrible that everybody necessarily, everybody fears it, but we don't we don't get definition of what it's doing that's negative. And this is one of those things I say about consequences. Again, for all the bashing I've done of RPM, one of the positive things about it is that we can point to Vengex and the fact that he wants to commit genocide against the entire human race. So the outcome is pretty bad. that Everybody will be killed and there are no more humans because of this mad machine. I get that. What is the negative consequences of the darkness taking over? That we'll all be frozen in time and not be aware of it? That we'll live in a world full of darkness where people can do that? I mean, it's just, well, it's not well defined. And this episode really kind of highlights it, that something bad is happening to Zed, that he's gaining more power, that he's losing his sparkle. But he seems indifferent to it. He really doesn't seem up. So it's like, like, well, darn, I lost all the sparkle. Well, that sucks. I mean, he's like Stephen Wright or something. It's just, I don't know. I don't get it. Um, okay, so back on track to the episode here. Um, so Glitter is shoved away. Schwartz and uh, her mother are killed. Uh, you know, and here's the thing. I say good riddance to Madame War because, frankly, I, I could care less about her. She's not that interesting. Because, you know, one moment she loves her daughter, next week she wants to sacrifice her daughter, now she loves her daughter, sacrifice. I don't know, I don't care, and good riddance to her. Schwartz, on the other hand, I liked him. He was my sec second favorite up to this point because he was he knew what he was doing, for the most part. He was proactive, he had goals, and to, to see him go, I just think we kind of lose that, that interesting aspect. Because it would been interesting if we had two factions of villains, maybe if Schwartz had actually left, gathered his own army, so we have two armies of darkness going against each other, that would, would be something. But he's gone, and the whole thing with Glitter, we can drop that. Um... There's indication, you know, Glitter is still around. She obviously has her own train now. She can go wherever she wants. She can do whatever she wants. She's no longer tied down because she no longer has her lover. She no longer has her mother. And she's afraid of Zed. She doesn't want to be around him anymore. So it's likely we won't see her throughout the rest of the series. I'm sure I'll be proven wrong. But logically, her story is ended uh, from a narrative perspective. The only thing I can imagine is that she does have some sort of uh, revenge or vengeance against the Emperor, and while I don't think she will directly contribute to the final conflict or, or the final assault against Zet, uh, I can see her 
maybe given her uh, train to the rangers to get to uh, the, the terminal where they don't have to use the drill or any type of trickery or anything. That they, she just, hey, here's my dark train. You can use that, and I will never see you again. That that's kind of that seems to be more reasonable because I I don't see her charging with the other Tokuja on the fortress and storming the castle and doing stuff like that. And again, narratively speaking, other than revenge, um, her story is done with. Um, now. I'm. I believe that uh, Mork and uh, Nero are are dead as well. Um, it the episode makes it clear that Schwartz and Or are dead, but doesn't necessarily say that about Mork and Nero. Um, I wish Mork is dead because I'm getting sick and tired of her. I really don't care about her anymore. Nero, there's something about him I like. I can't put my finger on it, but it would be interesting if Zet just tired of everything, that he's now more consumed by darkness, that he is alone now, and he's the last one. All he has is crows, and he has a few monsters at his disposal, that all his allies, those that did care for him and pretended to care about him, are all gone, and he's alone. And there is a great shot at the end where he is walking back to the castle on the train tracks by himself, uh, just all alone. I think that, that that's a very powerful image. And if he is indeed alone and everybody else is gone, um, then, then I think that'd be interesting because where does he go from here? Because when nobody's around pushing him, when Mork is gone, when Shorts is gone, uh, when everybody's gone, he doesn't have to marry anybody, he doesn't have to follow their rules. What does he do by himself? Uh, as the Emperor, who's interested in light and sparkles, what does he do with that? And what does it mean that now all the sparkle is gone? Does that mean he's no longer interested in the light? What are his priorities now? I think that's something we can go ahead and explore uh, as we continue in, into, the, into the show. Uh, or towards the end uh, of the show at that. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about Akira. So he comes back over to the side of good. Uh, he sacrifices himself to save the Rangers, although not really, because again, it's ill-defined as to what's exactly happening. And there's actually a really touching moment where he comes back and he feels that he has failed because he wasn't able to save the Tokyo hometown. But in that moment, all they're actually interested in is saving him, that he is back in their fold. That they do look at getting their hometown back as their ultimate end goal, but they do have these little goals along the way they're trying to achieve, and getting Akira back was obviously something that mattered deeply to them. But, you know, I'm still not buying a lot of the emotions coming from the Tokyo because, again, he was only gone for, again... It's been three episodes this has happened. I think in real time, it's probably been like a day, maybe two, or less than that. It's got to be less than two days. I, I'm certain of that. So, I mean, if he was gone for an extended period of time, I would get it. But I just think it's a touching scene, but I just think it's too forced given how much time has actually passed within universe. Uh, and it's a little sappy. Um, let's see here. Again, the Zord battle, uh, I really think it was amazing. They utilized all their Zords, all their combinations. They did everything right, I think, in those scenes. Uh, it's going to be hard to top uh, at the end of the series. If the end of the series comes down to an ultimate Zord battle, whether the Zords are destroyed or not, I would be curious to see how that happens. Um, I mean, I, I can definitely imagine that this would be like the crowning achievement of the Zords. This is ultimately where everything has come together, everything uh, works well, and, you know, hey, if this is the last battle with the Zords, then I do want to see the Tokyo get to their darkest hour where they lose all their Zords. Uh, I mean, it's worked well in Power Rangers and worked well in other Sentai, so I'd like to kind of see where they go from here because I don't see how you get much better uh at this point, other than, again, destroying all their Zords and taking them away. But as I've said before, taking the Rangers out of the Rainbow Line, no longer having access to the Rainbow Line, would have been great for the series. It just did not happen. Okay, a couple of other things. This episode is really good in atmosphere in, in a number of places. First of all, for Christmas episode, and again, this is part three of, of three episodes that began at Christmas, we saw very little of Christmas in the beginning. They were, like, pulling out the packages, or not the packages, but the Christmas decorations, and the Christmas tree was destroyed. Great foreshadowing or allegory or whatever you want to, symbolism, whatever. 
uh, from episode one. Episode two, we didn't focus on anything related to Christmas aesthetic or otherwise. And the ending of this episode actually does uh, work pretty well. It really gets in that Christmas mood. I like how, uh, you know, the, the trains are dressed up, what everybody's wearing, and just the, the atmosphere and the candles and everything. I think that's really handled well. Uh, I don't like the Merry Christmas at the end with everybody waving at the camera. It it juxtaposed against the actual ending of the episode and all the emotion it's felt. Uh, it, it just doesn't sit well, but I guess you have to have a little bit more of an upbeat ending, uh, I, I guess, for what happened. Um, because actually what was also really good is, so when Schwartz uh, is killed, Akira places his sword at a pile of rocks, and it's really great. There's this great sunset or, or fi- colored filtering where, you, you know, Akira you know, pay, uh, pays respect to his old friend and comrade, and I think he looks at him as well as a worthy adversary. Um, sort of like how the Joker always has this uh, demented respect for Batman, uh, that, yeah, his uh, mortal enemy is gone, but he respects and he laments the fact uh, that he's gone. Now, I've seen this in a number of other things. I can't think of any other than Batman the Joker at the moment, but, uh, you know, I, I really liked it. And, of course, when Akira when returns back to the train, they all these candles lit. I don't know what special significance they have in Japanese culture, so I might be reading too much into it. But they have a candle for Schwartz and a, can, a candle for, for Glitter, um, hoping, that she, hoping that they can basically find peace and, and be happy and all that. And that's a very sentimental moment. And even when... Glitter visits Schwartz his grave, drops the rose, and doesn't say anything, and starts snowing. I mean, that's really good. That's really effective. If we had moments like that throughout the series, um, man, that would have been great. You know, but I would also say that if Glitter and Schwartz were actually human actors in costume as opposed to just rubber costume monsters, it would have been so much more powerful. But as is, I, I still think it's a, a powerful scene. Um... Yeah, I mean, just a lot of atmosphere, a lot of good things in there, but um, I think overall the episode does lack from just overall issues with the series and lack of establishment of certain concepts, and... I just want, you know, I'm just hoping where we go from here that, again, we, we've shed ourselves of the baggage of Schwartz. We no longer have that issue uh, clouding. We no longer have the issue of Akira's loyalty. I think at this point he's firmly on the team. Uh, Glitter is gone out of the picture. Noir is out of the picture. Hopefully Mork and Nero are, are out of the picture. So it's all that's going to, all that needs to happen now is they need to find their hometown, liberate, and defeat Zed. That's all they need to go ahead and do now, and with about six episodes left, they should be able to go ahead and do that uh, with very with very little problem. Now, what are they going to do for the last six episodes? Mm, beats me. I have no idea at this point, but uh, they just need to, uh, like I said, they need to be proactive. We need to do something where they realize this is our best chance to go defeat Zet. Now, whether that means they need to kill him, imprison him, whatever they need to do, Tokyo now need to realize that this is our best opportunity. The darkness is at its weakness. All of our opposition is gone with the exception of Zet, and we know where our hometown is. So once they're done eating their Christmas cake and everything and opening presents, um, they need to start getting real about this situation. Because... I'm going to leave you guys with this thought. The series began with a bunch of adults that didn't know who they were, and they they only had memories of being children. Now they know they're children. They have to grow up. And I think this is the point of the series where they have to grow up now. That victory is within their grasp. They need to go out and seize it. And the adult thing to do would be to go out there and do it. That, that's what needs to go ahead and happen, and I, and I want to see that. And I hope that's what's going to happen in the next few episodes. I could be wrong. I hope I'm right. But uh, I, I would like to think that Tokyo will satisfy me in the, the finale and think things will get better. So there we are. Uh, I want to know what you guys think uh, about this episode. Do you think it was good? Do you think it was bad? What's going to happen next? Leave your comments below and let me know. Otherwise, I want to thank you guys for listening, have a good evening, and the tavern is now closed.